race to win wars and explore the stars, have created some of the most fantastic products ever designed, and we use them every day, unaware of their amazing origins. On Wicked Inventions The Bicycle, the secret wartime past of our two-wheeled wonder. Encryption World War II coding techniques that are keeping your email safe today. Energy bars. Military food technology, providing energy for our busy working day. We reveal the amazing science and manufacture behind these wicked inventions. The Bicycle, an invention that today we'd be forgiven for taking for granted. From country lanes to inner cities, mud tracks to racetracks, they're everywhere. Whether we use them simply to get to work, for sport or for leisure, since their invention in the 19th century, the humble bike has grown into a familiar sight in our everyday lives. Initially called the Dandy Horse, the Bicycle had its first incarnation as a wooden frame and solid rubber tyres with no pedals. After over 40 years of improvements to this design, in the 1860s, the Velocipede was invented. This was not only a redesign, but it changed the entire way the bicycle was used until then. The Frenchmen, Pierre Michel and Pierre Laramont, equipped the traditional bike with a pedal in the front wheel. With its elevated saddle and giant wheel, the Velocipede became famously known as the Penny Farthing. The huge success of this new model meant that bicycles became one of the main means of transportation. It became a symbol for progress and growth and synonymous with Victorian gentry. As the bicycle evolved, it came as no surprise that this nifty invention was soon adopted by the military as armies sought light, easy and speedy transportation methods. If you go back over 100 years ago, go back before the First World War, an officer perhaps would have seen the use of a bike within barracks. Cheaper than a horse, easier to use, all you've got to do is repair the punctures. By the end of the century, all the European armies and the US armed forces had bicycle infantry. In the anglo Boer War of 1899 to 1902, bicycles played a little known but very important role. Two cyclists were usually assigned as orderlies to a commander in order to carry his messages. Cyclists would also often act as a communications link between the cavalry and infantry. To no surprise when World War I broke out, all combatants used bicycles for the cycled infantries, including scouts, messengers and ambulance carriers. It was such a huge military success that they were an integral part of the Japanese victory in taking Singapore in World War II. Their tyres had gone. They were on the rims of their bikes, but they were still cycling alpha leather towards Singapore. And the British forces believed that were tanks coming because the rattle of these bikes. Big mistake, it was the Japanese on push bikes. A unique use of the push bike. It may be out of regular military service, but the bicycle is as popular as ever. The bike is durable, reliable, environmentally friendly, and extremely cheap to run. It gives freedom of movement to all of its users. In many parts of today's world, the bicycle is still the main means of transportation, commerce and leisure. With over 1 billion bikes worldwide, it surpasses the use of the automobile. At Enigma Bikes in the United Kingdom, they produce bespoke handmade titanium bicycles for cyclists all over the world, taking extreme care to keep the tradition of this wicked invention alive. After carefully hand-selecting the best tubes and parts for each bike, the first step is to set up the jig with the precise measurements as specified by the customer. A jig is essentially a device that holds the frame and guides the tool that is to be used. Once this has been done, the tubes are then measured and cut to size, before mitre joints are formed in the tubes by cutting bevels of equal angles at the end of each piece to ensure that the main triangular frame of the bicycle fits snugly together. The rear drop axle and the head tube are then placed onto the jig, ready for the welding process. A bicycle is a very simple device, but it needs to be designed correctly. Geometry is important, as is the choice of material. Getting all those things right will mean you will get the most efficient machine. The tubes are first tack welded into place. 
Tack welds are smaller welds that hold the frame together ready for the main welding process. Before this is done though, the frame is lifted from the jig and placed onto the alignment table ready to be tracked and checked. The down tube is checked first followed by the seat tube. It is important to do this through several stages of the bike building process. With the frame aligned, the main welding process can begin. This hand welding is done with expert precision and forms an entirely sturdy and durable frame for the bike. The quality difference between a, a mass-produced bike and a handmade bike is, is quite substantial. A handmade bike is exactly what it says on the tin. It's made by hand, it will be made with, with probably better materials, it will be made with much more care and it will be designed to be not only useful but a thing, a thing of beauty. That's what a handmade frame is. Facing cuts the outside of the tube and reaming opens up the hole to a slightly bigger size. This process corrects any distortions inside the tube that could have been caused in the welding process. Now it's time to give the frame some TLC. As much care is put into the bike's appearance as with the building process. The frame is scrubbed to give it a neat finish before the branded decals are applied by hand which are specific to the model of each bike. The frame is then ready to be passed on to the mechanic to be built up. To begin the build, the front fork of the bike is added to the frame. The mechanic measures the steering tube of the fork and cuts it to size so that the headset and handlebar stem can be fitted. The bottom bracket of the bike is prepared in order for the chain ring and pedal crank arm to be secured into place. Rear derailleur gears are fitted to the frame along with the brakes before the handlebars are slid into the stem. The rear cogs, or cassette, are carefully placed onto the rear wheel of the bike, tightened and then it's all fitted to the frame. The mechanic adjusts and tightens the rear brakes before adding the front wheel and also adjusting the front brakes. The brake and shift lever is slipped into the handlebars and fixed into place. He then measures the chain by hand and cuts it using a chain splitter. This is then linked to create a seamlessly joined bike chain. At this point, the rear derailleur can now be lined up with the cogs. Brake cables are measured and cut before being fitted to the bike. The mechanic then adds stops to the ends of each cable to prevent them from slipping out of place. After fixing the cables neatly to the handlebars, handlebar tape that has been specially designed for the perfect combination of comfort and endurance is wound around the bars. With this done, the mechanic runs through the gear changes of the bike ensuring no problems such as a slipping chain. He unboxes and fits the pedals, then attaches the saddle to the seat post before this is slipped into place. We have a team of very, very talented individuals here who produce stunning, stunning bicycles that we sell all over the world. And that's it, a perfectly engineered, handmade bike from start to finish, ready to hit the streets. The internet has given us an enormous sense of freedom. We can browse, watch, buy and share almost anything. But with so much information being passed around the globe, growing concerns about data and privacy protection have led the best minds in the world to come up with ways to protect our information. And the solution? Encryption. Encryption is really taking any readable message and transforming it so that it becomes impossible to understand or read it if you don't have the secret key and this allows you to take a message and send it without anybody else being able to read or understand it. While we think of encryption as a thoroughly modern concept, it has actually been utilised, studied and refined for thousands of years under the science of cryptography, which literally means secret writing in ancient Greek. Indeed, it was the ancient Greeks who have left us some of the earliest examples of trying to baffle snooping eyes. The ancient Greeks used uh, to write messages on pieces of leather that were strung around a wooden stick and then if you take the leather off the stick it kind of unfolds and it becomes impossible to read the message unless you have the right type of stick to put the leather around again uh, and, and recompose the message. So people have been doing encryption and, and finding ways of uh, hiding their messages for a, for a very long time really. 
The first known use of cryptography dates back to the times of ancient Egypt, in the form of hieroglyphs that were carved into monuments. Since then, civilizations throughout history have used cryptography to send encrypted messages to their generals, monarchs, and lovers. Wars have been won or lost with the help of cryptography, either by one side successfully hiding their communications through encryption, or by the other side breaking their enemy's codes and decrypting their messages. The encryption that was used in World War II, um, by the Germans in particular, went back to the last days of the First World War, really, where the original Enigma machines were being developed as a means of taking a message and using substitution to replace the characters of the message by something else so that the, the information becomes uh, unreadable or, or secretive. So much of what went on in places like Bletchley Park was really about trying to understand what happened in those Enigma machines and how the code worked so that by knowing what the keys are and how the code logically works you can then reverse engineer the plain text message from the encrypted message that you uh, intercepted. When the internet arrived, scientists and technology experts of the time started using encryption to secure data traffic traveling around the network. So of course, today we rely on encryption um, to keep our communications on the internet safe and secure and, and reliable. And, and in fact, without encryption, the internet as we know it today would not exist. Digital encryption is produced by using complex mathematical algorithms to encrypt and decrypt the information that is being passed back and forth. An algorithm is nothing more than a series of steps you take, uh, so you get some input, you perform a number of steps on it and that generates some output. That's basically what an algorithm is, a, a recipe for a set of steps of things to do with a piece of information uh, to produce uh, output. Today, one of the most common forms of computer encryption is asymmetric key algorithms. How it works can be explained by this simplified scenario. Imagine Tina has a private message she wants to send to John. Tina and John have their own padlock boxes. If Tina wants to send a message to John, she asks for his unlocked padlock box. Once she receives it, Tina puts her message inside and sends it to John, who uses his own key to open it. If John wants to reply, he asks for Tina's open padlock box and puts his message inside, locks it and sends it to Tina, who then uses her own key to open the box and read the message. Understand? Sounds very simple, but behind this simple explanation, there is complex mathematical work that goes into real-world computer encryption techniques. Encryption is used in all aspects of our modern day life. We rely so much on technology that without encryption, the data of our lives would be exposed and open to abuse. Many commercial applications, things like online banking, but just also knowing that when you connect to a web server, you connect to the genuine web server and not some fake server that is trying to steal your details. Those sort of things rely very heavily on encryption in order to be able to work. In order to make our electronic world more secure, we had to rely on a technology from the ancient military past. With thousands of years of evolution, encryption is by far a wicked invention. Is encryption complicated? Well, yes, but here is one you can do yourself. The cipher we're going to use is based on binary XOR operation, where two inputs will create an output. The inputs can only be a zero or one, and the result can only be a zero or one if you follow these rules. Two zeros inputted will result in a zero output. A zero and a one will give you a one. A one and a zero will lead to a one. And finally, a one and a one will leave you with a zero output. The letter A in binary code is written as 01000001. Our tester comes up with a key, which basically means he randomly attaches different values for each digit. In this example, he is using 11101010, but he could use any combinations of ones and zeros. He then adds each digit together to create the cipher text. If we follow along the line, 0 plus 1 equals 1, 1 plus 1 equals 0, 0 plus 1 equals 1, 0 plus 0 equals 0, 0 plus 1 equals 1, 0 plus 0 equals 0, 0 plus 1 equals 1, and finally, 1 plus 0 equals 1. 
this gives us the cipher text 101010111, which, without the key, is random gobbledygook. Now, if our tester's friend has the key, he can take that gobbledygook and apply the same XOR operation. So, 1 plus 1 equals 0. 0 plus 1 equals 1. 1 plus 1 equals 0. 0 plus 0 equals 0. 1 plus 1 equals 0. 0 plus 0 equals 0. 1 plus 1 equals 0. 1 plus 0 equals 1. And voila! 01000001, our original binary letter A. The secret? The reason this works is that if you apply an XOR operation twice, you get the initial input again. Clever stuff. The key can literally be any combinations of ones or zeros that you want to use. Just remember, you need the same key to unlock your super secret cipher. Food and water are two of the most basic human needs for survival. Our bodies need to eat, drink and to process these foods. Well, the average intake for a fully grown male is 2,500 calories and for a female about 2,000 calories. Of course this completely changes and depend is dependent on your height, your build, your size. So it really does depend on what you're doing because KCAL it's like what you put in is what you get out. So your body needs these to kind of keep operating, keep going, and the more you're doing, the more food you need. With our busy lifestyles and exercise regime, sometimes you need to reach for a handy nutritional snack, and the energy bars seem to be the answer. But did you know that these bars have military origins? Food is hugely important in, in any military environment. It effectively acts as a fuel, clearly, for armed forces personnel and particularly for land forces, for soldiers, and marines, who absolutely need the energy um, to be able to fuel themselves to go and do what they need, quite often in very arduous circumstances. During World War II, the authorities were struggling to meet a soldier's recommended nutritional needs. Alarmingly, troops were still being supplied with hard tank biscuits that had been around since the Romans. However, in 1941, the US War Department sought to design a meal that would be non-perishable, ready to eat and fit in a soldier's pocket. The result was the K-Ration. The K-Ration was the first pack to manage hunger and provide energy. In total, three meals were provided. Together, these could provide a soldier with a desired calorific intake of 3,000 calories. A year later, it was issued across the US forces and taken up by their allied partners. The food science behind this is, is absolutely fantastic because they're looking at the needs of the body, how it can get that shot of energy, how it can have those calories replacing what he's using up all of the time. Soldiers in kind of out in the field, field rations at the moment by the US military, the UK military, They're set at around four and a half thousand calories, so double the average intake. And that really is seen as, you know, going on long slogs, marches, um, intense physical exercise. Energy bars today promise to replace meals by giving you nutrition in a handy snack sized bar, ideal for our busy lifestyles. So the protein in the energy bars, they are used mainly, they can be used as energy, but actually mainly to use to help repair your um, muscle and to help build it back up again. Their constituents have a low amount of fat and fibre, and this is mainly that fibre can reduce the absorption. It slows down the release of sugars into your blood system, and so hence keeping it as, a, as low as possible actually allows you to get a quick peak of sugar into your bloodstream when you need it. There are still some bars that stick to their military roots. Soldier fuel is one such bar. Manufactured in Canada since 2004, it has been specifically designed to meet the needs of the modern soldier. The story of the bar is basically the three brothers got together and we created an energy bar that was designed for special operations forces. It delivers steady energy, it gives you a fruit-based sugar burst initially up, and then it gives you this protein modulated stream that, of steady energy uh, for a steady energy burn. And the product took off. Among all the interesting ingredients that we have in soldier fuel bars, we are using soy crisp to 
give the protein level that we need in this bar in combination with uh, a more tasteful ingredient like Rice Crisp, which will give the crunchiness and the volume of the bar. So we need to blend them together in order to have the format and the dimension and the nice looking bar that we want. All the ingredients are added to a double Sigma arm mixer. The double blades rotate and mix with a constant torque to make a dough. Once the product has been mixed, the bowl is tilted forward and the dough is released into a stainless steel bin and taken to the slab former. The dough is drawn through a continuous feed slab former, which creates the base sheet of dough onto a line below. Then a topping layer is added to the new slab before it goes through cooling. It makes its way through a slitter called a solage that cut the dough into long individual rows. The line then moves up to the guillotine where the final shape of the product is determined and then cut to those specifications. There, there's a lot of different things that happen behind the scenes, like the quality for instance. We make about half a million bars a day. Uh, we have about 20 people on the line. They have all sorts of different tasks to make sure that we make a really high quality, tasteful product. Uh, we check the weight, we make sure that all the ingredients are in the, in, in the right proportions in the bar. Every single bar is individually weighed. So we have a very uh, automated system that rejects the bar with an air burst if, uh, if the bar is not just the right weight. The fresh bars then travel along the lines individually, where they have to pass numerous weight and visual inspections by up to 20 people, as well as multiple machines. Once we blend all these ingredients together, we get a mixture that will look like this. And we need to make sure at this point in the lab when we work on, on the final product that, that the texture of it and the stickiness and the, uh, the appearance also will be the one that we're looking for. Once the bars have passed their inspections, they are sent up to a doughboy machine, where they are individually wrapped and sealed in a specific foil that maintains a very long shelf life, making soldier fuel perfect for the military, outdoorsmen and survivalists. They're fed into a machine which very precisely seals them in their wrapper and cuts the wrapper just right, it crimps the ends just right and seals that energy bar, and that means it's now protected from moisture, that means it stays fresh for an extraordinarily long time. The freshly wrapped bars then move further up the line, where they are boxed by machine and sent along the belts, where they are gathered and made ready for distribution. SEALs use it, Special Operations Forces use it, foreign militaries now use it. But what became interesting to us was civilians and elite athletes like triathletes would say, wait a minute, if a Navy SEAL is eating this energy bar, then I'd like to eat this energy bar too. Let me give it a shot. It began as a product for elite special operations personnel, and then the civilian world took interest. So there you have it. A dash through the hidden history, super science, and amazing manufacture of products that you use every day, but have never realized their amazing background. The bicycle, encryption, and energy bars. All wicked inventions.